Hello, welcome to Chapter 17, Industrial Supremacy. Okay, so essentially this is about the uh, rise of the Gilded Age and industrialization and then the backlash to it. Okay, here's a picture of a smokestack. So the industrial techniques, um, what you get is you, in, during this whole time period, you get the increase in efficiency um, through the development of technology and through the managerial process. Okay, and so one example of this is the new steel production techniques. Uh, so the Bessemer process where they blow air to remove some of the impurities in the steel making process. Also the open hearth method. Um, this leads Pittsburgh to become the, uh, the center point of steel production. So all you football fans, again, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Okay, you can bring in the coal, you can bring in the iron from Michigan and Minnesota. Um, and you have the water to transport all those things there, which makes an ideal place to manufacture the steel. Uh, you also get the rise of the petroleum industry. So the petroleum will serve as a lubricant for many of these machines. Um, and some of the impurities that uh, come off it the, uh, will serve as the kerosene, which will replace uh, whale oil as, as a um, medium for, uh, or as a method for lighting, okay, for creating light. Okay, in addition to that, uh, you get the airplane and automobile. So um, again, Henry Ford, and not that Henry Ford, uh, Henry Ford did not create the automobile, but what he was able to do was he was able to um, bring together the concept of the assembly line and the automobile, uh, dramatically dropping the price and the amount of time it takes. And so just to give you an example, before it used to take 12 and a half uh, hours to produce one car, now they can produce roughly a car and they can produce a car in roughly an hour and a half. Okay. And consequently, because they're more efficient, um, it also drops the price. So in 1914 automobile cost $950 by 1928, it's down to $290. Okay. Um, another source of industrial growth is the research and development. And so what you get is you get uh, corporations spending money on uh, research and development. That's how you come up with new ideas and new products. But what you really get is you get a marriage of universities and un industrial research. And so we're better to conduct some of the uh, R&D than professors, okay, and, and people in those fields that are teaching those fields in the universities. And so you get the combination of those two, and that will really lead to U.S. dominance um, in the industrial economy. Okay, another source of industrial growth is the science of production. So Taylorism. Um, Taylorism is this idea of how do you reduce wasted movement, okay? You're trying to become efficient. And so literally they had a stopwatch and they would time your movement. So like if you're working at an auto plant, how long does it take you to take the tire and put it on the automobile? And what Taylorism does, it uh, has, well, it has a couple of effects. It, it de-skills the jobs. So now you really, it is an unskilled job. Anybody can be trained rather quickly to perform it. Um, it takes any creativity out of the job it's just rote movements so over and over again which will lead to uh, actually uh, health concerns um, but it really it takes all the fun out of the job and the um, and the other aspect of taylorism and so that if it takes you uh, 12 seconds to move the tire off the rack and put it onto the thing they're expecting you to be able to perform that way for the entire day which as you know that over time you tend to get tired you whatever your mind tends to wander um, and so it really, you know, people saw it as a way to oppress the workers more, okay? Because now you can hold them up to some kind of standard that's not really realistic. And so then with the moving assembly line uh, with Henry Ford again, um, by bringing the work to you, you can make it even more efficient, okay? So the, the equipment would come to you or whatever parts you need to put on would come to you and the car would come to you. It would save that, that much time. Okay, uh, railroad expansion. Um, you get the expansion of railroads. And remember last time we talked about railroads in the early 1800s, they weren't really efficient because the different gauges, um, primarily in the north, uh, they really, they're really they independent of one another, so you really couldn't create a network. Now they create a um, standard time, okay, so to avoid mishaps. But really, it is uh, the railroads are important because it creates a multiplier effect. And it's probably the most important industry at this time. And what that means is to build a railroad, you need steel, you need coal, you need lumber, um, you need finance. 
and it, it creates demand in all these other industries okay and so what else allows for the industrial growth of railroads uh, they have the air brake is invented so now you can carry heavier loads and still stop uh, you have stronger steel to allow you to carry heavier loads you have standard gauge okay so this is the accepted uh, metric for the width of the track and so that way you can really create it across the country okay and that gives you an example of the railroad network that's created across the uh, the country and now in the red if you notice it's 1870 to 1890 so that is the growth after world war or after after the civil war not world war ii okay another source of industrial growth is the corporation if you remember last time we talked about corporations uh, not many um uh, in the early 1800s and the first industrial revolution here in America, uh, not many people uh, used corporations. Uh, one, because it was hard to get because you had to go from each state had their own different rules. Uh, a lot of people looked down on corporations because they felt it was cheating because you weren't risking your personal, uh, your personal assets. Um, here, the corporation, the limited liability becomes more popular. Okay, and again, the, the purpose of incorporating is that you, you risk only your investment, not uh, your personal assets. Um, so you get industrialists like Andrew Carnegie that come to dominate, uh, like the steel industry through the corporation. Okay. In part, it is because he is able to, um, raise the capital to buy not only the, um, not only the steel furnaces and the steel companies, but also by the shipping companies that bring the iron ore by coal mines, by iron mines and things like that. And then we'll talk about that in a little bit in the monopolies. Um, on top of that, uh, his managerial techniques, and so he has layers of uh, managers. It's about finding good people that can produce at a high uh, at a high rate, and so in the corporation that allows for production and uh, for promotion of folks. Okay, it's a picture of Andrew Carnegie. J.P. Morgan is the banker who bought out Andrew Carnegie, creating the first billion dollar company at that time. Okay, um, so what you get is uh, you get uh, two forms. Okay, this is a source of confusion, so listen carefully. Horizontal integration is when you tend to buy out all your competitors. Okay, so for example, if Nike was trying to create a hor horizontal, an integration is really just monopoly, horizontal monopoly, they would buy out Adidas, they would buy out Reebok, which I think is Adidas actually, they would buy out Skechers, they would buy out all their competitors. A vertical integration, vertical monopoly, is you would buy out all the things that go into making your product. So again, if Nike was trying to buy or create a vertical monopoly, they would buy the shoelace companies and they would buy the rubber sole companies and they would buy uh, paint companies to paint their shoes or dye companies to dye their shoes. I guess you don't paint them. Um, that's the difference. Horizontal, you're buying out your competitors. Vertical, you are buying out uh, the suppliers, the things that you need to make your product. And so what you get with uh, Rockefeller Standard Oil, um, he is actually, he first practices vertical, or I'm sorry, he first practices horizontal, um, horizontal monopolies, and then later he will actually get into vertical as well. And so, and the, the reason why industrialists would do this, um, they saw competition as wasteful, right? So if we're always competing and driving down prices and things like that, we're making less profit, it's wasteful. And it's just better if somebody controls the industry um, then we could, then we can cut out waste that would, you know, everything that was made would be sold. Okay. Another way, because they started, uh, some states started outlawing monopolies. So how they used to get around this was um, a couple of different ways. The trust agreement, the trust agreement, and don't belabor this point too much. The trust agreement is they would have a trustees, a board of trustees supervise, quote unquote, all the companies under standard or under standard oil for this instance okay so they they technically wouldn't be owned by standard oil but they would be supervised by this board of trustees and that's how you avoid the monopoly uh, laws the holding company is you would have one company and they would buy stocks in all the other companies okay and so again they don't own it but they are a shareholder in the company like other shareholders um, and that's how they used to get around. So there's a, there's a brewing battle here in terms of monopolies and whether they're ethical and then subsequently whether they should be legal. Okay. And so there's some states that are starting to ban monopolies and this is how industrialists got around those, the trust agreement and the holding company. And so what happened is uh, you get this, um, you get this myth of the self-made man. Okay. 
that these uh, capitalists, all these industrialists, all started from the bottom, made their way to the top, just like Drake. Um, and how do they justify this? Is social Darwinism, right? So if you take that idea of survival of the fittest, right? They they kind of misapply that idea, and they apply it to society. So if somebody's rich, well, they must be the most fit. Okay, and if somebody's not rich, then they must be less fit. And it justifies the status quo. And it doesn't take into account any laws that might be broken or any, what we, well, what we would say now is illegal or even back then unethical techniques in terms of trying to drive out your competitors. Okay, and so the, the just going back, myth of the self-made man, this is this idea that you did it all on yourself as opposed to um, having assistance from the government in terms of having laws and roads to, to ship stuff on and railroad networks that are, you know, help subsidize in part by the government to ship stuff on. Okay, so along with this idea, this gospel of wealth, the gospel of wealth is actually Andrew Carnegie idea. His idea is that you should give it all away before, um, you should give it all away before uh, you die. Okay, but so a couple ideas, the stories that are told to help promote this idea of the, the self-made man. Uh, Russell Conwell's Acres of Diamonds, and he would argue that you had acres of diamonds under your feet and that um, you just needed to look down and see the potential within yourself. And then you too can become rich. And Horatio Alger is the, uh, the rags to riches story. So it's a series of books um, about Horatio Alger and how he, again, made it from the bottom to the top. Okay, so if he can do it, then anybody can do it. And that becomes a synonym for pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. So start at the, ba the beginning of the backlash to capitalism. Now we have some uh, some thought leaders here. Uh, Lester Frank Ward argued that we needed uh, government planning. Okay, without government planning, again, the people that are on the top are always going to be able to um, tweak the rules or and and keep competition from developing and, and so that they can stay on top. Uh, you get Henry George. Um, Henry George is the uh, guy that argued the labor is the only true source of capital and we need a single tax to discourage land speculation. So what would happen is people would buy land and they would sit on that land and that means somebody else can't use it. So how could you discourage people from just sitting on land without it being used? Um, you put a tax on it. Okay. And then last word, last, last word. Lastly, we have Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. Edward Bellamy is this, uh, wrote a novel, so he put it in the form of a novel to, so people can understand it. Uh, in his novel, Looking Backward, um, the protagonist gets knocked unconscious, wakes up in the year 2000, finds out that we have transitioned to socialism peacefully. Um, everybody can, uh, everybody can have their needs met. Everybody's doing fine, and so we're producing so much, really, that everybody should have their basic needs met. Okay, so the problems of monopoly, and monopoly sounds like it might be a good thing, um, but once you have a monopoly, uh, that there's artificially high prices. Without competition, and so that's the basic like Adam Smith ideal, without competition, um, they can charge as much as they want. And if you need that product, so you need kerosene to light your lamps in your house, you're going to pay no matter what. Okay, with competition, they can compete against one another that drives on prices. Um, secondly, it really creates this unstable economy. Okay, so things will go uh, boom and bust, and once uh, people have limited uh, their income and they have their purchasing power is limited because of the monopolies, uh, that will really be a source of instability. Okay, the um, immigrant workforce again. People are coming in from southern Eastern Europe at this time. And so that uh, they're different from the Irish and Germans, okay. And again, some sometimes different religion. They look different, and so part of uh, part of actually how the Irish and German get assimilated because there's another wave of immigration coming in, okay. So now the ethnic tensions are with those uh, that new wave of immigration, okay. So in addition to that, the wages and work conditions, there's a loss of control. Like you are literally just another cog in the factory. Right? You get hurt, and then they kind of discard you and just go hire somebody else. Um, it's repetitive work, which means uh, that you run a higher risk of injury, um, pay you at a 
below cost of living. So how do they determine that? Like, what does the average family need? And this is the debate today, right? How much does the average family need? And not to live large, but just uh, just to have some basic needs, met, enough food, enough uh, utilities. And they set it at a certain rate. And then if you get paid under that rate, you are just kind of out of luck, right? And there's nothing nothing you can do about it. So, um, again, it's, so it's unsafe, long hours, very impersonal. Okay, so what you have here is um, you have women and children at work. Uh, they can pay women less, and so if they can, they will hire women to work there. In fact, so some of the early unions actually cut out uh, women because women increase the size of the labor force, which then will drive down wages. Um, child labor laws, and so the attempts to pass child labor laws, and you would think, like, well, who would be against that? Uh, sometimes it's the workers themselves. And so why have child labor um, one, you need for, from the perspective of the workers, they need it for the they need the children to work for, in order for families to survive, right? So, the husband and wife just don't make enough. Mom and dad don't make enough to survive. So now you need the kids to work. Um, and if you remember, the work is now de-skilled, right? And so now you can have children work because literally it, you don't need to know anything to to be able to perform it. Um, the struggle to unionize. So what do we you know what can workers do about this? Uh, the National Labor Union, uh, they try to take small unions and turn it into one national organization. Uh, successful for a little bit, but then with the Panic of 1873, that is um, that kind of undermines its effectiveness. Uh, you get the Molly Maguires, the militant coal miners, um, but they, however, aren't trusted by the wary or by the middle class. They're wary of the Molly Maguires because of their some of their radical ideas. Okay, so what can you do if you're a worker? Um, really, there's a couple different things you can do. Uh, well, strike is the most prominent one. So you have to have a labor union. I don't know why Brinkley does this and goes out of order, but uh, um, you can go on strike. And so the, there's a great railroad strike in 1877, ties up the East Coast. And with all these strikes and with the effectiveness of the union, the question is, who does the government side with? Does the get Will the government side with the workers and the unions or will they side with the owners okay and here and during this whole time period actually they side with the owners and so the government breaks up the strike uh the great railroad strike in 1877 and that will be true of other strikes as well uh the knights of labor is one of the labor unions that forms um and so the knights of labor they are inclusive okay so what that means is they include men women uh blacks immigrants in their ranks, um, skilled and unskilled. And the Knights of Labor, their demands were these broader social goals, right? They um, they not only wanted to improve the work conditions, eight hour work day, no child labor, um, but also government, um, the, uh, they wanted government reforms. Um, so it, was, it wasn't just about the here and now for the workers. Unfortunately, what happens with the Knights of Labor is that uh, there is a Haymarket protest. Someone throws a bomb and kills some police officers. Uh, it's blamed on the Knights of Labor. Okay, and so the Knights of Labor become associated with radicalism and they kind of fall apart. Um, the other union that shows up at this time is the AFL, American Federation of Labor. Um, they're opposed to females working again because uh, more females in the labor force that will drive down uh, their bargaining power. And so their agenda, their agenda is um, the bread and butter issues, okay? So they want better wages, better working conditions, shorter uh, work day. So they want the here and now just for the worker. They're not concerned about changing the world. Um, they want just better conditions, okay? And so I don't know why Brinkley puts the Haymarket Square right here. But essentially, again, that does away with the Knights of Labor. AFL is still around. But the AFL, oh, I'm sorry, and they organize just white males, white male skilled trades, because those, it's easier to bargain for somebody with a skilled trade. You can't replace them as easily, um, unlike uh, unskilled workers. So unskilled workers trying to unionize them is difficult because if they go on strike, they can be replaced by somebody else because it's unskilled. Okay, other strikes that show up, um, you get the Homestead Strike. Homestead Strike is a strike against Carnegie's own Carnegie Steel Plants. Um, his partner is actually is Henry Clay Frick. Um, the workers go on strike, and when they try to bring in replacement workers, uh, they block the entranceway and they attack the replacement workers. 
Um, Frick then hires the Pinkertons to help break up the strikers. Uh, there's violence that breaks out. The police come, state police come, and they arrest the, the union workers. Um, meanwhile, somebody breaks in and tries to assassinate Henry Clay Frick. He doesn't, he, he doesn't uh, get killed, but they, they do try to assassinate him. Again, this, this further cements this idea in the minds of the public that unions are, are radical. Okay, so the union is eventually defeated there. Uh, the Pullman strike, similar, situ well, similar situation. There's a strike. They, they stop. They get people to, um, the P Pullman cars are the sleeping cars. And what they do is they get the other unions to not send the railroad cars. And so they essentially get the railroad cars to stop moving. And part of the strike was the, the Pullman workers, they were paid in scrip. And so scrip is, scrip is like if any guys shop at Kohl's, it's kind of like Kohl's cash, right? You can use it there and spend it there like money, but you can't use it anywhere else. And so the workers uh, lived in companies' towns. They had to pay rent to the company, you know, to live in their homes. They had to shop at the company store. Um, and so what happens is they cut their wages, but then they also raised the prices of uh, things in the company town. And so the workers then, it was, it was too much. They, they went on strike. And this is where Eugene Debs uh, makes his mark as a union organizer. Um, he will show up throughout uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s as a union organizer. And that, that strike is then broken by President Cleveland. Um, the argument being that uh, this is interfering with the delivery of U.S. mail, so therefore he can intervene, and he does. And so again, the question is, who does the government side with? Do they side with owners or do they side with workers? Okay, so why doesn't the, why aren't labor unions very successful at this time? Again, the uh, nature of the workforce, it's, um, it, it's transient. And so uh, the, what that means, they just, they move, they don't stay in one place. Uh, they tend to be uneducated, they're immigrants that come over here, or they, they come over here and uh, they're willing to work for less. And so it's hard to organize them and convince them that it's in your long-term interest if they stick together. Um, but really the other thing that kept labor from organizing was the corporate strength, okay? And so that they're rich, uh, they had access to politicians, they had political influence, they had power. Um, and frankly, there just weren't a lot of laws that limited their abilities and so they could do what they want. And you couldn't pass laws because, again, they they had a lot of political influence. And so at the end of the day, the question is, who's missing from this discussion? And it really is the government. And so what is the government's role in this in, in growing industrial society? So thank you for listening. Uh, don't forget to buy the merch, and we will see you next time.